are in different stages there, and there are so many for whom Mother's Day um, can be a tough day. It can be a hard day. And so today I just wanted to say we honor each and every one of you. Mother's Day for me was tough for a while. I, um, I was blessed for, uh, back in the year 2000, I uh, gave birth to my son. Um, that was probably about the last time that I was able to hold my son. Um, <laughs> I guess it's inevitable that a nine pound five child will grow up to be six feet five. But, um, so I was blessed. I had an, inc- I, you know, I became a mom back in 2000. Um, some of you know some of my story, and today I just wanted to share a little bit of it. I have argued with, de- with God about this, but I'm going to share a little bit of my story. So my son was born then. Um, he was born in the month of June, at the beginning of June. Um, two weeks later, on his way to visit my son, my brother-in-law was in an accident on my street, and he was killed. So we went from the best month ever to what became a really, really difficult month. And it was, you know, we talk about the best of times, the worst of times. We lived through this new life, but we also lived through the grief of grieving for for my brother-in-law and everything that was entailed in that. And life just got a little crazy and life just got a little hectic and and grief was a big part of our lives for, for several years. So to be honest, for several years, we didn't really talk about having another child. I had always planned that I would have two children. I wanted to be just like my parents, a boy and a girl, alpha and omega, one of each kind. That was it. That had always been my dream, my plan for life. But we just, things were just hectic. I'm sure in the back of our mind, well, I can speak for myself. In the back of my mind, part of me struggled with, wait, you had a child one week and the next week somebody in your family died. If you bring another child into your family, are you playing Russian roulette with the, I'll be, with the rest of your family? I'll be honest, it was, it was a tough thing because grief kind of does that to you and things were hard. And when Jace was about three or four years old, I read an article and the article that I read was about Stephen Curtis Chapman, uh, the Christian singer and his wife. And they were adopting little girls. They had adopted two little girls from China. And it was like I could not let go of this thought. I could not let go of that story. I could not, it, everywhere I turned, I saw about little girls being adopted from China. I saw about how many orphans there are in the world, how many kids don't have families. And it just wouldn't let go of me. And I started to pray about it and say, God, is, is this something that you want from me? I don't really understand why you keep throwing this up um, around me. And I really, really felt God say to me. Now, somebody asked me the other day about God talking to me. For me, when, God, when I can say God talks to me, it's like I get something in me that I just can't let it go. And it's something that I would never think of for myself. And this thought came to me and God, I know, talked to me. And he said, listen, you're going to have a daughter. You're not going to give birth to her, but you're going to have a daughter. And I really felt that that was God's plan for me. So I went to talk um, to my husband about it, and I thought he'd say, you're crazy, we can never do this. And he said, if you feel that this is something we should do, I'm gonna trust you, I'm gonna go with you. Of course, for those of you who have ever looked into it, the one huge roadblock for an adoption, especially a foreign adoption, is the cost involved, is astronomical. It is a ridiculous amount of money that is involved with that. So I thought, you know what, if God provides the money, then I guess this is something I really feel that we should do. I had made a small investment after I graduated college, and would you know, it made a ridiculous amount of money on it. And in fact, the amount of money that I made on that um, investment around that time actually was gonna pay for this adoption. So we decided that we would start the process. Paperwork social workers, paperwork, trips to Chinese consulate, trips to the state department, medical tests. It was a huge, huge endeavor that we started on, but I really felt that this was God's plan for my life. 
throughout that, we went through the process. And as we were going along, we got to know families who are also in the same boat as us. It got to be so exciting to get to know them, knowing that one day we were all going to go there. We would pick up these little girls and we would bring them home. And we even got to this part where I started buying things. The great part about adoption is you know what you're having. So it's kind of easier to buy things and to pick them up started looking into names, imagining what it was going to be like when we brought home this little girl and and what life would be like seeing her and being able to provide her with a home that she would not have had otherwise. Of course, at that point, my life exploded. I shared the story before. My husband left. And things kind of just fell apart. Uh, China at that time had changed their adoption rules. Single parents could no longer adopt. Um, I didn't have the money to start it all over again anyway. It was uh, incredible that I'd had it the first time around. And my life just was shattered. My life that I had envisioned, my life that I had always planned pretty much for my whole life. I am a planner. I like to know exactly how things are going. And the life that I had thought I was going to have basically had burned down. And I was sitting there in the ashes of how I thought my life was going to go. And a lot of you kind of walked with me through part of that. Most of you did not know the backstory about the adoption. A lot of you knew about what was going on with, with my family and becoming a single parent and all of those things. And as I sat there in the ashes and in the ruins of my life and how I thought my life was going to be, I watched as those families that I had got to know brought home beautiful little children, little girls, and it was hard. It was really hard. And some of you this morning are sitting here in what you are looking at and you think is the ashes of your life. You're sitting here and things have not gone the way that you had planned that they were going to go. Your marriage may be hanging on by a thread. Your finances may be flatlining right about now. Your employment status may be all over the place and so uncertain and you have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow morning when you head into work. It may be that Mother's Day brings up a lot of disappointment and a lot of despair in your life and mother the fact that maybe today you are not a mother or you may not have your mother or you may be a mother who it just hasn't quite worked out the way you had planned you may have buried a child you may have just never been able to become a mother in the way that you had planned and this morning the problem when happens when those things happen when despair creeps in, when the, we get a note from the doctor to say, you know what, this is not good. When relationships aren't where they should be. When maybe your kids are nowhere where you would hope they would be at this point in life, spiritually or otherwise. And the problem at those points is that when despair creeps in, when disappointment creeps in, when bitterness creeps in, when all those things creep into our lives, our natural inclination is just kind of to ball ourselves up to hide from it all and just pretend maybe if i just have nothing to do with anything and the problem is that as we are balled up we are looking downwards we're looking inside ourselves and when we look inside ourselves we see despair we see disappointment we see all these things we see the broken dreams that we had the hopes that we had laying shattered And the problem is, as we look into those, we become more despondent. We despair more. We become more bitter. We become more hurt. The more that we look into ourselves, when those things are happening, they can tie us up in knots. And they can make us a prisoner of whatever that situation is. And the life verse I want to share today with you is found in the book of Zechariah. And it says this. Return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Even now, I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. 
I love those three words there, prisoners of hope. It's so easy for us to become prisoners of despair, to become prisoners of disillusionment. It's so easy for us to become bitter and hurt by everything that is going on in our lives. Now, what is hope? Now, for me, hope is one of those words that I probably use way, way too often, okay? So Friday, I was in the mall, and I, whenever I walk in the mall, I hope that my favorite designer has a 99% sale on my favorite pocketbooks, okay? Hope. We had hoped today that we would be able to serve you ice cream at the end of this service, because that's how we finish services when the weather's nice and I'm preaching. Sadly, the weather is not nice, so sadly, there will be no ice cream today, which means, which means next week, when Dad is up here, he will take credit for the ice cream. But I just want you all to know, I went to the ice cream distributor, I bought the ice cream, and now you're all hoping we have your favorite flavor. So, uh, hope, it's one of those words we just use, I hope this happens, I hope this happens. I, and it becomes a word that we use way, way too often. And actually, for those of us who are in Christ, for those of us who have a confidence in Christ, the word hope actually means this. The word hope is this, the confident expectation of what God has promised. The confident expectation of what God has promised. We talk a lot about how there is nothing is impossible for God, how there is not one thing that God cannot do, but actually there is. God cannot lie. So if God said it, we can be confidently expectant that this is going to happen. So when despair says to me, that I'm alone, my life is falling apart, nobody cares, I don't care, nobody is there for me. Hope reminds me that my God has promised to never leave me nor forsake me. He will always be there no matter what is going on in life. Dis disillusionment may say things are never, ever, ever going to get better. This is it. This is my life. It's, it's how it is. Hope reminds me that God says that he has promised for me, right? He has plans for me, and his plans for me are to prosper me and not to harm me. Jeremiah 29, 11, okay? Bitterness says, bitterness says that nobody cares about me. Hope reminds me that God loved me so much. He sent his son to die so that he can spend eternity with me. That's how much he loves me. That's what hope reminds you. Fear says that the doctors know everything and that they have the final word. Hope reminds me that my God is Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals, that by his stripes I am healed, and that he is the master physician, and ultimately he has the final word. Do And fear also tells me that my kids are never going to get better. This is the way they are. This is what's going to happen. They're a lost cause. Hope reminds me that God's timing is perfect and that the end has not been written in the lives of my kids, in their stories. God is in control. Fear, despair, despondency, disappointment says one thing. But when we become prisoners of hope, when we become people for whom hope becomes the thing that we hold on to, the thing that we grasp onto, when hope is the thing that we lean on no matter what is going on in life, hope is the confidence that I know that God will keep his promises. There's a man in the Bible and a story that most of us know, and it's the story of Noah. And Noah, uh, for the, you know, Man in the Bible, Noah was about, a, he came about a thousand years after Adam, so he was a little removed. He lived in a time in the world where things had gotten very, very bad. People were not doing what God had wanted, so God said to him, listen, you're about the only good guy around here, so here's what I want you to do. I am going to destroy the world, but I want you to build a boat. I want you to build the ark as we uh, know it, and you and your wife and your three sons and their wives are gonna go in there. I also want you to bring in two kinds of every animal. I'm gonna send rain, I'm gonna destroy the earth, and 
you will be safe with your family. So the Bible really doesn't tell us much about Noah's emotions while he was in there. But there are some things that it does tell us. And I think, to be honest, when I say that he was probably feeling a little hopeless, when we see the things that the Bible does tell us, we realize that maybe that's the case. So Noah entered the ark when he was 600 years old, okay? You think that's an amazing thing. He had his kids when he was 500 years old. Just giving you guys the heads up. All right. Seven days later, the rain began to fall. The rain fell for 40 days and 40 nights. The floodwaters spread across the entire earth, covering the mountains to a depth of 20 feet. Covering the mountains. So when you look around and you see some of these incredible mountains that are in the world, remember, add another 20 feet. That's how deep the water was. All living creatures on dry land were wiped out. The flood covered the earth for 150 days. 74 days later, the tops of the mountains became visible. Two weeks later, he saw dry land. Noah stayed in the ark another 57 days until the Lord told him to leave. So he was 601 years, two months, and 27 days old when he left the ark. So if you add it all up all together... Noah spent one year and 17 days in the ark. Now, I was blessed a couple of years ago. Um, Eric and I went on, on a cruise. I'd never been on a cruise before. This was not a cruise, okay? There was nobody serving him his favorite foods. There was nobody making animals out of the towels every night before he went in there. In fact, not only was nobody serving him his favorite foods, he was in charge of all these animals that were in there, which means, to my mind, it means he was feeding them, he was cleaning them out, he was making sure that their needs were taken care of. There was no swimming pool, there was no movies, there was no entertainment. They did not stop anywhere. There was no balcony. It talks a little while later about they opened a window. Okay, so you are stuck in this boat. So this boat was 450 feet long. Here's how I measure things, and a lot of you will. One and a half football fields, okay? That's how long the ark was, this big, big boat. In fact, if you took the space shuttles, you could put three space shuttles on the top deck, um, nose to tail, and that's how long this was. It was three times the height of what this, the roof here, okay? So there were three decks. Each deck was as high as this. I guess when you're talking giraffes and everything else, you have to have plenty of space. So here he is. He is stuck on this boat for one year and 17 days, floating aimlessly on the surface of the ocean. No idea how long he's going to be there. Knowing that God had told him that he was going to get it, go into that boat, but actually there was no end date God had told him. He just said, get in the boat. It's going to start raining. I'm sure wondering, are you going to have enough supplies? Are you going to have enough rations? Are these animals going to start turning on each other at any given point? Knowing if he had one of every animal, I've watched enough at National Geographic to know that may not have been the best uh, place to be. So I'm sure there must have been moments where Noah, like us, wondered, okay, what is happening right now? Is this going to get any better? And I just want to pull two points out of this story um, that Noah, it, in Genesis, so this uh, story goes between Genesis 6 and Genesis 9. In Genesis 8-1, there is a verse that really um, astounds me. And it says, Genesis 8-1, it says, but God remembered Noah. Now, before I discovered an app for doing this, whenever I would need to go shopping, I would nicely make a list of everything that needed to, I needed to buy, when I got to the store, I would diligently make sure that everything we needed was on that list. But my average of the list getting from my kitchen counter to stop and shop, to be honest, was about a major league batting average, okay? I, if I was batting 300, it was a good thing. You know, chances are most of the time, again, before I discovered an app for this, most of the time, the list would not make it to the store. Now, what that would mean would be I would aimlessly walk around stop and shop, hoping that God would just shine a spotlight on the things that I needed to get, okay? And then knowing that there was something I was forgetting, what am I forgetting, what am I forgetting, 
And then as soon as I was outside and I had unloaded 20 bags into my car, it would come to me like divine intervention. That's what we needed. Okay? This was not how this worked. God was not spending his day doing God stuff and saying, there's something I need to remember. What is it I need to remember? I don't remember. Ah, oh, the man with the floating zoo on the uh, water. That's who I was. That's not how this worked. God remembered Noah throughout everything that was going on. God remembered Noah. Now, you may be sitting here this morning and you are in despair. You may have had something catastrophic happen and you may feel like, you know what? God's forgotten me. God doesn't remember me. There is no way that God would let me go through this. There is no way that any of this is God. And in fact, if you had feel that way, you're in some pretty good company in that the book of Psalms, David writes, and he says, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning oppressed by my enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Ever said that to yourself? God, where are you? How can this be something that you've allowed? How can this be something that you're letting happen to me? Where Did you forget about me? Psalmist said that. And if you want to go higher up, actually Jesus, when he was on the cross and, and, and as he was uh, dying and... You know, and he said in the book of Mark, he says this, and he says, and at three, it says in, at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You may feel this morning that God has forgotten you. You may feel like God has forsaken you. You may feel like God is nowhere to be seen. How could he be with everything that is going on? In the book of Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 14. But Zion said, Zion being uh, Israel, it says, I don't get it. God has left me. My master has forgotten I even exist. Ever had times in your lives like that? Ever had times when you felt so alone, more alone than you've ever felt before? Then you're going to love this next part. It goes on to say this. Can a mother forget the infant at her breast? Walk away from the baby she bore. But even if mothers forget, I'd never forget you, never. Look, I've written your names on the back of my hands. Good one for Mother's Day. Some of you are sitting here this morning and part of your hurt and part of your disillusionment comes from the fact that your mom was just not really the mom that you ever envisioned she would be. She may not have been the mom that you see on all the TV shows. She may not have been the mom that all your friends had. She may not just have been there for you in the way that you ever expected her to be. She may not have nurtured you or raised you in that way. And this morning, I want to just remind you of this. Moms are human. Moms make mistakes. But guess what? God will never forget about you. No matter what your earthly mother did to you, you have a heavenly father who loves you, who is there for you. And it, the ver- that verse goes on to say um, in Isaiah, sorry, John. The verse goes on um, to say about how God has written your name on the backs of your hands. Now, I said I have an app for the shopping list now because that's the way it's 2019 we, we do those things. But even with the app, even if I make a manual shopping list, if there is something that I have to, have to, have to get, you know what I do? Write it on the back of my hand because my hand goes everywhere with me, thankfully. So I'm never going to forget that. Love this here. God has every single one of us. You are not forgotten. You, me, no matter all my issues, no matter all my insecurities, no matter how many times I mess up, no matter how many wrong things I do, God loves me. God is, wants to be reminded Charlotte Pendleton, okay? Must have a big hand because my name is Charlotte Elizabeth Pendleton, so he needs to get um, all the space. But God has your name God has my name written there. So there is never a moment we are far from his thoughts. We are far from him. God has not forgotten you. I hope this morning that you are reminded of that fact. When we cling to God has promised, when we become prisoners of hope, you know what? Emotions don't get in the way. We just need to be reminded 
of what God has said. And God in that verse has said, I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forget about you. In fact, I love you so much. I have you, your name on me. God has not forgotten anything about you. Second thing I get from this story um, is this. So at the end of the story of Noah and the ark, as we get towards the end of it, God, and Noah kept looking out to see, God, is this over yet? Is this over yet? And he talks about the fact that he opened the window on the ark. Again, the size of the boat, the window he opened. And he sent out some birds. And first of all, he sent out a raven. Um, and the bird just kept flying back and forth and back and forth. Then he sent out a dove. And the dove went out and, and then it came back. So then he sent out the dove again. And this is the part I just want to remind you of this morning. In the midst of a huge boat, a huge expanse of water, because if the whole earth is covered, that's all you are seeing. Noah is on this huge boat with some massive animals, okay? I've been to the Bronx Zoo. I, I know elephants are big. Hippopotamuses are big. Rhinoceroses are big. Giraffes are big and tall. All of this bigness that surrounded him, all of these big things that surrounded him, hope came to him in the form of the dove returned with an olive leaf in its mouth. This morning, you may be facing giants. This morning, there may be things going on in your life that are just huge and you just cannot see past them. And I just want to remind you this morning and encourage you, look for the signs of hope. They may be the smallest, smallest thing that can come to you in the midst of everything else that is going on in your life. But God sends them to us. He sends them to us in a word from the Bible. He sends them to us with just a small whisper in our ear. He sends them to us sometimes through friends. He sends them to us in all different ways. I'll be honest, there are some days when I'm really not feeling my best, and I'll go on my Instagram feed, and I am convinced God sends things, because there are things that pop up on there that people have posted, and it's like, wait, that was for me today. That was just what I needed. God is there, and he just wants to remind you, and he just wants to remind you that he is there. The psalmist says in uh, 119, my soul faints with longing for your salvation, but I have put my hope in your word. See, God doesn't always send huge flashing signs. God doesn't always get, send big, big signs and big wonders and, and all of these things to remind us that we need to hope that we need to become prisoners of hope, that we need to get in ourselves the hope that says, I know that God's promises are true. I know that I can expect him to do the amazing things that he has promised to do. Hope can come in the tiniest, tiniest of ways. And in here, the psalmist says, my soul faints with longing for your salvation, but I have put my hope in your word. God, I wish you would hurry up. God, you know what? This needs answering right away. God, you know, you, know, you, you should have fixed this already. Uh, do you forget about me? Do you know what's going on in my life? But guess what? Even though I feel that way, even though I cry out to you, I'm not giving up. And that is the confidence that hope gives us, the confidence of knowing that God will answer in God's time, in God's way. It may be something tiny that births a seed within us and gets us going, but God is there for us. Psalm 42 5 says, why my soul are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God for yet I will pray, will I will yet praise him, my savior and my God. Sometimes we just need to remind ourselves in the midst of whatever we are going through to look around and see the evidence of God is indeed with us. It's easy for us to get consumed with disappointment the problem being if we dwell in disappointment, if we dwell in despair, if we dwell in worry, if we dwell in all of these things, it will bind you up, it will tie you up, and it will keep your focus off of the one who needs our focus. That's why prisoner of hope. You know what? Let hope envelop me. Let hope consume me. Let hope remind me that no matter what is going on in life, 
I know I have the confidence that God is there for me. Look up and see even the smallest signs that God is with you and will come through for you. See, when Noah saw that olive leaf in the beak of the dove, he knew that his hope in God had not been dis- misplaced. He knew that, that what he'd been longing for, he knew that God was going to follow through and that God was going to be there with him for the rest of the time. And you may see little right now to justify hope. But hold on to the little, little that you have and keep believing for more. When there's nothing, just keep on hoping. When there's nothing again, just keep believing. When it seems you got it wrong, keep believing. When it looks like you're about to be embarrassed, keep hoping because God will never, ever, ever let you down. The answer may not be what we're always expecting and the answer may not always come in the way we're expecting, but he will always be there for us. In Lamentations, the author of Lamentations says this, peace has been stripped away and I've forgotten what prosperity is. I cry out, my splendor is gone. Everything I had hoped for from the Lord is lost. The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Yet, I love this part, I still dare to hope. When I remember this, and if you forget everything else I've said this morning, remember this. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh. Each morning, I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. In him, in nothing else. No matter where you are this morning, no matter what giants you are facing this morning, let me encourage you. Let that be your tattooed somewhere yet i dare to hope hope being the confident expectation of what god has promised knowing that god cannot lie knowing that god's promises are new every morning knowing that god will take care of whatever situation i am in yet will i hope let's become prisoners of hope Now, let me say, this morning, some of you are sitting here and you switched off about 20 minutes ago because life is good and you're coasting right now and nothing is going on. Can I just say, just, I I don't want to speak ill on anybody, but life is life. Put this in your back pocket. You never know when you're going to need it. Become prisoners of hope this morning. Noah, of course, the end of the story, he gets off of the ark. He lives for another 350 years, okay? So he died when he was 950 years old. He got to see God's promise being fulfilled. And this morning, I know that for some of you, you, you know, you're wondering, will I ever see God's promises fulfilled to me? And the answer is yes. May not be fulfilled in the way you expected, but the answer is always going to be yes. Most of you know how my story has uh, transpired and has gone on. I'll give you a daughter, you just won't give birth to her. When I got married to Eric uh, nine years ago, of course, four teenage daughters came along with that package, okay? So, and I am convinced because God felt bad, not that he, I'm, I'm kidding around, felt bad about the fact that he threw me in at the deep end with four teenage daughters. I have three granddaughters too that kind of makes up a little bit for that. Your story is gonna come out, but yet will I dare to hope. No matter what I am facing, no matter what is going on, instead of becoming full of despair, instead of focusing on the hopelessness, instead of worrying about what is gonna happen, instead of looking inwardly, I'm gonna look up and I'm gonna say, God, you know what, I'm gonna trust you. I know this morning, whatever my story is, your promises are true for me. Your promises, you never lie. And you are the one who is writing my story, my story being a lot different than everybody else's story. God is the God of variety. And the fact that I just want to put my hope in you this morning. Hey, will you stand with me and let's pray together this morning.
Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning, and I know that in this room there are a lot of different stories. There are a lot of different scenarios. There are a lot of things going on right now. And this morning, I just ask that you would help each and every one of us to become prisoners of hope, to become people who look for hope in all situations, to become people who are confident in the knowledge that you are there for us and that all your promises are true. And we just ask this morning, give strength to those who need it. Give comfort to those who need it this Mother's Day. Give peace to whoever will. But most of all, we ask this morning, give hope to each and every person that is standing here in this room. And we thank you for it. Amen.